whenever I have an opportunity to, to speak, and particularly when it's in a Sunday school class or whether it's in a church service or something that's faith-based, United Methodist men, it always begins with prayer, and I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. Uh, I want it to be not my words, but the words that the Holy Spirit would lead and give me a resolve to share. I pray also, I was reminded this week, it's not about what the words are necessarily, it's about how the Spirit works in our hearing of those words. And it always starts with a self uh, inspection for me as well too. I don't know how many times I've shared something that really begins, it's what God wants me to learn more than anything else because we are on this journey as I've mentioned already a couple times together and so um, before we begin and I, I just ask we just bow our heads in prayer for just a moment and uh, enter into a period of reverence as we approach the throne. Father we thank you that we call you our Father. We thank you that you're, we're our ch your children and Father, we just pray. We know where two or more are gathered together. There you are also. And so we thank you for your presence internally dwelling inside us through the presence of your Holy Spirit and collectively as a body, as a congregation. Father, we just want to have our ears open to the words that you would have shared this morning so that we can take that message and we can use it through the Jerusalem that you placed us in to make a difference for your kingdom. We thank you for the privilege we have to be called your children and the responsibility that we have to share that good news to those around us. Bless this time together uh, as we spend uh, worshiping you in word, in song, and uh, in prayer. In Christ's most precious name we pray. Amen. I will go right to sports analogies. In 2004, the Summer Olympics, Matthew Emmons, I don't know if you're familiar with that name or not, but Matthew Emmons entered the competition, his being rifle competition, as the easy favorite, the clear favorite to win the gold medal. He had accolades that were strewn about and superlatives that were said that it did not take long from the commencement of that competition for people to see they had great validity. Round after round, he built such a progressive lead that when he got to the final round and the final shot, all he had to do is hit the target and the gold medal would be his. Didn't even have to hit a bullseye anywhere on the target. He steadied himself and readied himself for that final shot. He lowered that level of arousal and, and breathed in and slowly exhaled. He focused, he raised his rifle, he looked intently through the sight towards the target, slowly squeezed the trigger, the bullet emerged and pierced the bullseye, dead center of the target. To his surprise, the light did not turn on that usually signifies the target's been hit. The sound did not tone that also would identify a bullseye. It was then he raised up and saw that he shot the wrong target. In one shot, he went from first place to eighth place in the Olympic Games. And we wonder, how could somebody that's an expert and authority that has spent countless hours in their endeavor make that type of error. And it's happened since the beginning of time. The keepers of the law, the Pharisees, the Jewish sect that was most responsible, most authoritative into being the protectors of the faith, knew what we call the Old Testament thoroughly. They knew it thoroughly. They knew that there were over 300 references to the coming of the Messiah. And yet when Jesus lived right amongst them, they missed the target. In one 24-hour period, 29 prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, mathematicians have calculated the odds of eight, just eight prophecies being fulfilled as one in 10 to the 16th power. That's one in one and 17 zeros behind it. I had to look up and see if there was a word that describes what that number is. I don't know what the exact one is, but I know it's between a quadrillion and a quintillion. I know that that's a lot. And if somebody was that exceptional, you would probably, I would think, we would hope that we got it, that we could see it, and yet they missed it right from under their nose. I wonder how many times my mother told me that. It's right under your nose. It's right there. How many times do we miss it? And, and I look, as I remember my statistics course in college, and found out there's two types of errors. And the two types of errors are here are one is in identifying the target. That was Matthew Emmons. He identified the wrong target. And the second error is staying focused on the target. Somebody was once hired 
for a company that made drill bits. And I believe the company is up in Ohio and they take great pride in what they did. The metal alloys, as they explained, the precision that they put into it, they were world renowned as producing the best drill bit that has possibly been made. And that person said to them, it's not about the drill bit, it's about the hole. As soon as somebody comes along and produces a better way to make the hole, the drill bit industry can be gone. Take it from somebody who has eight track tape still in his garage. Anybody have those? <laughs> I, I used to joke, I'm not going to buy anything until they quit inventing things because once I buy it, it's outdated, it seems like, the next day. So uh, I actually had an 8-track tape player up until 1995 in an old car I had, and I gave a ride to one of my players. He said, Coach, I've always heard of these, but I've never actually seen one. <laughs> That's when you know that you're uh, uh, dated as well, too. So um, in uh, football. You knew it wouldn't take long. Nice toss. She's been in the family a while. In football, the target, it's all about the ball. It's all about the ball. I've stood before many teams and told them that. I've trained quarterbacks. One of them's a backup for the Tennessee Titans. I recruited him out of high school, trained him at Harvard. He was a starting quarterback the last three years of the Buffalo Bills, Ryan Fitzpatrick. And we used to talk about the target being the point of junction point. The breaking point is where the receiver alters the path of his route. The junction point is where the ball should be received into the receiver's hands. And then even more specifically on the target, I'll talk to him about the landmark on the body where I want him hit. I want you to hit the outside peck with a football. And I'll be adamant and very upset at times if it's not done the way that I intended to be done. They know what the target is, I guarantee, as I've coached them for years. At the same point in time, I know that there's distractions as well, too. The largest stadium as a head coach I coached in was the Swamp, 93,000 people. It's a distraction, let me guarantee you. It's unbelievable. The sound is so loud that I couldn't hardly talk to my coaches who were in the press box because the noise would come in through my headset like I'm wearing now and would reverberate back into my ears. It was almost useless. To practice, and try to get them to focus on the target, we would go inside the small gymnasium and crank up the sound system as loud as it would go, and yet we laughed on the sidelines of that game and said we couldn't turn it up loud enough to simulate what it was like when it was noisy at the swamp. For quarterbacks, I had a son that loved to do this, wet ball drill, because you might play in rain. Where we'd take a bucket out, put water in, dump the ball in there and get it all wet, and then they'd have to make the throws in practice, and the receivers would have to make the catches with a wet ball concentration drills. When they drop back to pass a one-on-one, -on -one, I would take a hand shield and hit them while they're trying to make the throw to distract them, to simulate what real life was going to be like, and that's what we live in as well, too. It's called inoculation training. Inoculation training is giving them a little taste of what the distraction might be so they can build up an indifference towards us when they get into that environment of 93,000 people and some people rushing at them and in 3.0 seconds having to be able to make that throw, there's not a whole lot of people that can do it. It looks easy on television. It is not an easy thing to do, I guarantee you. As believers, it's all about this. It's all about this. And you know, biblical principles work. There's an authenticity and there's an imitation. And we know that in jewelry, and we know that in life in general. But it's all about this. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As we look for markers, and we look for our avenues to stay focused on the right target, and to keep that concentration when the distractions are all there present around us, all Scripture is God breathed and is useful for the teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We heard it last week when we heard the Wesleyan way and the three simple rules. Anybody remember the three simple rules? Do no harm is number one. Number two, do good. And number three, stay in love with God. Those are the three simple rules. And yet there's distractions that come about. And we know that they're there. And that's one of the nice things and great things about us gathering together is we get a chance to have and pray over it an opportunity to recharge, to get reconnected, to stay focused on the target because we know the distractions are everywhere, even in the presence of this service. Coaches understand that. Coaches understand that most games are lost rather than won. I don't know if you knew that or heard that, but most games are lost rather than won. 
In fact, of every 10 game period, seven games are lost, two games the opponent is better than you. We won't talk about the Tennessee-Alabama game at this juncture. <laughs> and the third one is momentum. Ask Missouri about momentum and what can happen if you didn't see that result. But that's the case. In fact, we talk all the time about failure because defect elimination is where you begin when you search for the success. And we all want to be successful. I used an acronym for years with the, with the players and I would tell them this, you know, failure is an acronym. It begins with fundamentals and the breakdown of those fundamentals. When we lose the fundamentals, the A stands for aggressive. We become a little irritable, we become a little bit aggressive, we're not operating and functioning the way that we should. Then it becomes a downward slide into being insecure. You know, what are people thinking about me and so forth. I'm not producing the way that I need to produce. I wonder what they're thinking. Which leads to the L, which is being lonely, being isolated. Feel like you're only in this thing by yourself. Nobody knows what you're feeling and what you're going through. And that leads to a, the decline into being undisciplined. We forgot the fundamentals completely. We stopped doing the things that got us to where we were, whether it be professionally, personally, or spiritually. Which leads to R which is responsibility or lack thereof. Hey, it's not my fault, it's them over there. Coaches say, hey, for every finger that points out, there's three fingers that point right back at you. And finally, the E is empathy. If you trace those acronyms back, it all goes back to fundamentals. Fundamentals are the key. I don't care if you're an accountant, what my undergraduate degree is, debits equal credits, or what your line of work is, there are fundamentals, there are mission statement that you stay true to in order to be successful in whatever endeavor. You hear all the time on Sports Center, hey, we're going to get back to the basics. You've heard that before? We're going to get back to the basics. And yet, I've always wondered, why did you leave the basics to begin with? Because the basics are what it's all about. But what happened was, we either lost sight of the target, or we became lacked focus on where it needed to be. And the basics are these, the fundamentals are these in our Christian spiritual walk. Number one, it's all about Jesus. Rick Warren said in his very popular selling book, The Purpose Driven Life, very first page, it's not about you, it's about Jesus. That's what it's all about. So as we, as we look at that, I, I know it's about initiation and it's about continuation. Initiation is that faith that initially is towards a saving face of salvation in Jesus Christ. Romans 10.9, that if you confess with your tongue, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It says in Joel 2.32. Continuation is about our walk and our growth from that point of inception in our spiritual journey. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In Philippians 1.6, I take great joy and comfort in that. At the same point in time, I also know that there's a pattern and a truth that needs to be followed. There are truth and lies. He is the great deceiver. We know that's the enemy. That's Satan. He can't be everywhere. He's not omnipresent like our Heavenly Father, but he does have forces that try to get us off course. And quite frankly, a lot of the times when things are going difficult in your life, it's probably because you're staying true to the Word individually and collectively as a church and heading in the right direction and Satan and his enemies don't want that to occur. It may be spiritual warfare what you're going through. And we thank God for some of those occurrences because we give thanks in all circumstances, not for the circumstance, but while we're in the circumstance because we know we're on the right path. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way. He gives us the direction. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, Isaiah says, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. He is the life, and that eternal life, that everlasting life begins from the moment of our accepting Him as our personal Lord and Savior. It begins on this earth. It doesn't begin when we take our last breath. And so truth. He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is you do not belong to God. John 8, 47. I was in the interview one time, and I spent, as a, this was for an assistant coaching position, I spent more time talking about my faith than I did talking about football because that person was concerned about my faith. And as I sat there, that verse I just quoted to you went through my mind over and over again because I thought, how do I get them to understand because that person can't understand because they not, haven't had that inception. They haven't had that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So I trusted over to the Lord. I eventually took the job because I felt like that's where the Lord led. 
And I'm thankful, I don't say this out of pride, but I'm thankful that the things that I profess to that person that would lead towards me being a good assistant, this past winter my wife and I were standing with Grant Taft, the president of the American Football Coaches Association, when that head coach said to him, this is the best assistant coach I've ever had. I just wanted to represent Jesus Christ in what I did. I've been in another job where I was told, you mentioned Jesus Christ and I'll fire you. I can't express to you, as I heard people use it in vain, that name, how that made me feel. And yet I know that that's exactly where the Lord wanted me at that point in time. Truth is important to me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I believe this from the bottom of my heart. When the Holy Spirit reveals a truth to us as we grow in our walk, in our sanctification process, He won't reveal any more until you act upon what you know already to be true. We truncate our own growth by choice, by faith. And we don't want that to occur. German theologian, Lutheran theologian Rupertus Meldon has said this, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. And I mention that because I really appreciate Will for many reasons. And one of the things I appreciate is when we have the sacraments, we have the communion, he comes up and says, this is not a Methodist table. Everybody remember him saying that? This is God's table. I heard David Graves, our district superintendent, say to a district conference about a month ago, that he opens up and he sees, okay, this person was of the Methodist faith in an obituary. This person's of the Baptist faith. This person's of the Presbyterian faith. And how he really yearns for it just being about professions of faith. Interdenominational. So, as we look at things and look at the truth, I believe that truth is revealed and, and God has a revelation that is consistent in 100%. But the application can vary from person to person. To be involved in service, this church we've talked about is in our DNA is to serve. There's many ways to serve. But the truth is the same. That we are to serve. That we're called to serve. There are no exceptions. I believe that there is sacraments, communion. I've been in churches and in denominations where it was weekly. Sometimes monthly. Sometimes bi-monthly. And one place I was at it was annually. It was on Thursday evening before Good Friday. And I've heard people argue about, well, it should be this, it should be that. Do this often in remembrance of me. I think that's a non-essential. The essential is salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And in all things, love. In all things, charity. Second basic is it's personal. And Will said this last week, and I hope that you picked up on what he said. He said it's personal, not private. Hide under a, under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Many of you remember that from our childhood. What is the saying, that, uh, the article that came out? Everything I really needed to know I learned in kindergarten. It's personal to you, but it's not private. It's to be shared. We're here for a reason, as Pastor likes to say, and we're here for a season. And we don't know how long that is. And I truly believe the reason why Jesus Christ hasn't come at this moment and He may come at the next moment is because of His grace. Because there's still time for us to influence those that He's put us out amongst to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ so that no man would have to come to that perilous time at the end of their journey and say, I did not know Him. Because at one point, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. During my darkest time in my life, a period of brokenness, I went to a devotional, pulled it up off the wall and read it and did not realize at that moment it was going to change my life. And it asked this question, what are the four cornerstones of a Christian life? I immediately prayed over it and for me personally, this is what God told me. To be faithful, to be obedient, to be, live righteously and to serve. It was about eight months later that I was reading through 1st Kings chapter 3 verses 6 and 14 and this is Solomon when he's requesting wisdom from the Lord and in verse 6 it says this Solomon answered he's speaking to the Lord you have shown great kindness to your servant my father David because he was faithful to you and righteous and in verse 14 the Heavenly Father is speaking to Solomon and he says this, 
It says, And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Faithful, obedient, righteous, and servant. I saw all four of those and it was an epiphany for me because what was being described there was a man after God's own heart. And I've only seen that one other place in Scripture was a description of Hezekiah where all four of those things were prevalent. But I knew that that was speaking to me on how I needed to operate and live this life in each breath that has been given. But I also knew that it was supposed to be part of my testimony that I share each and every opportunity. We journey together and we it's personal. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. My ring inside, my wedding ring inscribed, Kim put, our journey, our testimony. And that's what we live individually. We all have a journey that's individual. It has spiritual markers. It has affirmation. It has divine appointments that are waiting for you. Some that we've missed, and I've missed so many. And some that are out there in front of us to be concentrated on, to be searching for. The third thing is it's collective. It's about Jesus. It's personal. And it's collective. It's about us together. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the different roles we have. The eyes, the ears, the mouth, and so forth. And it doesn't matter what the role is. It matters what the goal is. And that's what a team does. And again, coaches talk about that all the time. You know, we have strata for sin. God doesn't. Sin is sin. Omission and commission. We have strata for titles and positions and so forth. God doesn't. Whether it's within our church staff or whether it's within our church body. We all have a role. And no job's too big and no job's too small. Number four is it's a process. And a process means change. Change comes with difficulty at times. We read about pruning. We talk about storms. And I've said this before if you've heard me speak in some Sunday school classes. We're in either three spots right now. We're in one of three spots. You either just came out of a storm in your life. You're in the middle of a storm right now. Or you're about to go into a storm. And those are the three spots that we trade off being, places we trade off being during the course of our life. Storms are inevitable. They're unpredictable. And they're impartial. In fact, it says in Matthew 5.45, it says He causes the sun to, to come on the good and the bad. The rain will fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. The difference being is that as a believer, there's a purpose. There's a purpose to declare a dependence upon Him, to promote a growth with Him, to promote His name because you handle it in an exceptional way through the grace and power of the Holy Spirit that draws attention to our Heavenly Father because it just doesn't make sense. A normal person wouldn't operate that way. But you're not normal, you're exceptional because of the power of the Holy Spirit within you. For some it's financial, for some it's physical, for some it's family related. I don't know what they are. They're different for each person, but they're opportunities hidden in disguises. You know, that's why the, the scriptures have over 200 times the word test, trial, and tribulation is used. That's why the two most frequented words used in connection in the Old Testament are fear not. And in fact, some of you may have described some situations that have occurred or a situation you're in right now is excruciating. Excruciating comes from a Latin word that means out of the cross. Out of the cross. If we are to be like Him, we're going to have some small sliver of that cross. And if we get some small sliver of that cross, it means God can trust you. That you're going to handle it the proper way. Luke 9, 23 and 24 says, then he said to them all, If any would come after me, he must deny himself daily and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. Thankfully, we're together. The last point of the fundamentals is this life will conclude. He may come in a moment time and we will join Him. And it's an exciting day. What an exciting day that will be. 
We don't, most of the case, occasions, we don't know though. We don't know. We don't get to choose how it's going to come to an end, but we get to choose or when it's going to come to an end. We get to choose how though. We get to choose how to finish strong. Very few people in Scripture finish strong. If you look at back at the examples, I honored my uncle last spring who out of the blue uh, developed brain cancer and God extended this period of time and I know He extended it because of His faithfulness and because of His testimony that was being used and it made a difference and I saw it. So I went out to celebrate the way He finished, the respect that I have and honor for Him finishing strong. John Aquari. John Aquari represented his country in the 1968 Olympics in the marathon. A brutal race, of, some of them maybe ran in it, 28 and a quarter miles, 74 entrants in the 1968 Olympic Games for the marathon. 17 didn't even finish. Early in the race, John Aquari fell and dislocated his kneecap and kept running. The winner came across in Ethiopia, I believe, in a little over two hours. An hour and 22 minutes later, John Aquari crossed the finish line. And I get choked up just thinking about that, but he was asked, why? Why did you keep running? He said this, my country didn't send me 5,000 miles to start a race, but to finish the race. My contention is here is it's not where you start, it's where you finish. God didn't send us here to start a race. He sent us here to finish the race. And by the grace of God, that's what we're going to do. Our seasons, like our lives, the coach recognizes has a beginning, has a middle where it usually is a struggle and weary. I've heard from a couple of coach colleagues that have called me this past week and I've reminded them of that. And it has an end. Just a few weeks ago, Mariano Rivera, and, and I'm a Red Sox fan, so this uh, causes me great distress to bring this up, but Mariano Rivera exited the game. He exited a game and a career for the last time. 19 years, five world championships, and he left with practically every record that there is for somebody that's coming in relief from the bullpen. Incredible career. I want you to watch just for a couple of minutes here and watch how he exited the game as we get ready to conclude. Nathan, if you would. The reason why I show you that is this, because it hit me. As I reflected on it, it was more than a romantic moment in baseball. It's how I envision the end of my season. And I ask you to reflect on that too. What I see is God the Father and God the Son coming to greet me. Embracing them, bawling like a baby as He did there. Knowing that my days of triumph, tragedy, have come to a conclusion in those words that we want to hear, well done thy good and faithful servant, the smiles that we see becomes evident the crowd of witnesses represented by the fans in the stands that are always there and have been there and are waiting to greet us and have been battling for us on our journey here on this earth. Applaud that you've done well. And when he entered the dugout I saw the saints a picture hugging my father again. Relatives and friends that have gone before me. That's what I saw there. So I want to encourage you. As we there's going to be blown saves. There's going to be soreness, injuries. We're going to give up home runs. Just keep pitching. Just keep throwing. Knowing that your reward waits for you. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you once again. 
for the privilege here on this earth for a season to play for your team. Father, we thank you for your grace that is sufficient for us. We thank you for your mercy that it goes before us. May everyone here know that you love us. It's our shortcomings, our disappointments. May we finish the race. May we finish strong. And may we know what awaits for us is joyful reunion and a joyful time in reverence and celebration of you for all eternity. In Christ's name we pray.